He's heard by over 10 million listeners on his nationally syndicated radio show. He's a botanist, a medical anthropologist, and author of 25 books. Four of those were New York Times bestsellers. His latest is a departure from political commentary. It's called God, Faith, and Reason, and it's a glimpse into his personal religious faith and the Judeo-Christian values that are the foundation of American culture. Joining me now from San Francisco, the one and only Michael Savage. Thank you for joining us, Michael. Mr. Arroyo, it's a true pleasure to be with you and your worldwide audience. Well, the pleasure and is I ours. We can, I hope we can get into some, <laughs> some travels together. Oh, well, we'll do that before long. Look, at the beginning of this book, Michael, and I've read so many of your books. I've been listening to you for years. Um, Thank you. I was struck by the book because early on, you write, it was God who, that has given you your success, and therefore you decided this next book was going to be something for him. What did you want to give back to God, and how does this book accomplish it? I had come off the success of a series of New York Times bestsellers with my current publisher, Hachette, and they, they rushed after Trump won. They said, we want a book on Trump three months, mm. Trump's war, I called it. I said, I'll only do it if you publish my God book, because I've been promising my audience that the last book, Scorched Earth, Government Zero, would be my last political book. Mm -hmm. I have to give God back everything he's something. So you say, OK, they agreed to do it. So Trump's war became number one New York Times bestseller. Well, here we are a year later, well, actually nine months later. The book is out just before Christmas. What am I trying to do with the book? I feel that by writing this, having written this book, God, Faith, and Reason, which goes back literally since I'm a teenager, and by drawing people into my stories, family stories, childhood mm -hmm. in New York, working for dad in his little store, you name it, I'm going to trick my audience because throughout this book, I cleverly included some Old Testament sayings. Every other page, if you'll see, they're set in an old-looking typeface, quotes from Ezekiel, Jeremiah, biblical quotes throughout the book, in bold, filling up whole pages. Mm -hmm. So what is the whole game here? The game is to take the secular reader on a journey with me because they love my stories. And in so doing, they say, "What's? oh, look, I haven't read the Bible in so many years. What's this stuff from Ezekiel? Mm -hmm. What is Jeremiah saying thousands of years ago? Gee, that applies now. Maybe they'll come to understand that these words may have eternal value. And in so doing, maybe, just maybe, they'll be drawn back into their own faith because Raymond, you have a largely religious Catholic audience, am I correct? Well, half, half evangelical, believe it or not. And we have some Jewish viewers as well, and even seekers, non-Christians. I understand why. Uh, however, so many people don't understand that as secular or as atheistic they may think they are. Mm -hmm. They weren't born when they were born. In other words, the world didn't begin when they were born, and it doesn't end when they die. Mm -hmm. Meaning, they're not two generations away from a very religious ancestor or relative, grandfather, grandmother, great-grandfather, right. grandmother, whether it was a priest, a rabbi, or a churchgoer, they were there. So it's in their DNA. It's in their genes. And I'm, I'm hoping to excite that DNA in them to what their true heritage is. Hmm. Michael, do you consider yourself a person of faith? I'm like Mother Teresa. I go in and out of, I go sort of in and out of it, but there's not a minute that I don't think about the eternal, meaning when Mother Teresa in her last years, finally, I think they wrote her, they, they released her, her uh, journals or something, mm -hmm. her diaries. Didn't she say there were days she didn't believe and she was so ashamed? Well, it was bad, of, yeah. Of, she had a crisis of faith. It wasn't that she didn't believe, but she sort of had a crisis of faith where she didn't feel God's presence. She knew he was there, but she didn't feel it. And that in itself is sort of the walk of faith, I thought. Well, there it is, feel. That's a big word. Mm -hmm. I mean, my book is God, Faith, and Reason. It's not God, Faith, and Feelings, but... <laughs> <laughs> certainly, certainly without feeling it, you know, you're not really there. Right. I mean, how many, people go, how many people go through the rituals of religion and don't connect in that church or in that synagogue? Mm -hmm. And so I tell stories of when I was a young man, born Jewish. My father was not really religious. He just didn't believe in much. My mother would light the candles every Friday night, and it gave me a certain calm to know that she believed in, in something bigger than now. Maybe it was tradition. But the fact was, is uh, feeling, feeling. And so when I was a teenager doing my wandering, 
I would go into any house of worship that that attracted me. I mm. I went to I went to an Abyssinian church in Harlem, New York, all blacks. I met a preacher on the street, struck up a conversation. He jumped in my old Volkswagen Beetle. I said, well, I'll take you to your church, Brother Billy. And we drove up there, and I said, this room was shaking. Hmm. That Abyssinian church was shaking. I said, these people not only feel God, they make God feel them. Hmm. Years later, I wound up in Berkeley, California uh, with my wife and my little boy. I walked into a um, Chabad, which is a Orthodox Jewish temple in a makeshift place, and I saw what I had seen in the, I'd never seen, which was, am I going on too long? Go ahead, you can I walked in there with the men dancing in a circle with their hands on each other's shoulders. That place was shaking like the Abyssinian church. It was shaking like a Fijian village, but they were Jews mm. with the big beards, with the black coats. And in the circle, I walked in a stranger with this little red-haired boy, God bless him. And the rabbi reaches down, takes my son, puts him on his shoulders, and drags me into the circle. And there's a chapter there called Dancing with Hasids. Now, that started a whole road of mine. I'm not a religious man, but I certainly respect their religious-osity, religiosity. Mm -hmm. And so, therefore, these chords all resonate in me, and, and I think are resonating in God, faith, and reason. Yeah, Michael, in the book, you decry, and I've heard you say this over and over again, the secularization in America, where people of faith religious ideas, the notion of God is pushed to the margins of society. Yet in some ways, if I'm reading this right, you, you call people out in the beginning of the book for not practicing their faith. But the author himself doesn't really practice, do you? I do. Tell me what's, you know, when I've read religious teachings in mystical Judaism, they say that the man who actually feels the presence of God is closer to God than the man who does the rituals and doesn't feel the presence of God. Hmm. And so having said that, I believe that my fear and my awe of the, of the power of God is a form of practice in its constant. It's, it's not, I don't think a single breath goes through me without my recognizing that it could be my last. <laughs> Sorry to be so fatalistic. No, no, no. Well, look, this is, a, this is an important concept to know that, look, we're not here forever. Death, death away. You know, if you look at some of those old paintings of saints, you know, you go through Rome or you go through different parts of Europe. In the corner of the, the painting, my kids were always spooked because there's a skull down there with a little crossbones beneath it. Mm. Well, that was the, the momento mori, the remembrance of death. Your death is coming. We're all going to go the same way. That's not a bad thing. In fact, it clarifies the mind, as you say in the book. Well, I think that if you dwell on this, it can render you powerless and you can't move. People mm -hmm. can get frozen with fear. I think that in spite of the fact that we're mortal and in fact that we're all going to go by the way of all flesh, we have to embrace life. Jewish people say, therefore, choose life, mm. not death. The death worshipers, the atheists say, therefore, choose death. That's our society, unfortunately, today is embracing death in every form, whether it's through drugs, violence, rampant sexuality, that has no meaning. That's a, that's a form of choosing death, isn't it, Raymond? Mm, it so is we, indeed, have yeah. to look, we have to look at the other side and choose life, the life-giving side, the family, the religion, mm -hmm. the faith, the congregation is life. In an interview in 2009 in the New Yorker magazine, they asked you about your father and you said he didn't like talk of faith. In fact, he sort of forbade it. Uh, what mark did that leave on you? Did that make you um, uncomfortable with faith as a younger man? Well, he didn't disallow it. He just didn't believe in God. He didn't think that there was anything beyond uh, his death. Mm -hmm. It was a very cynical uh, view of an immigrant. I'm an immigrant's son. After all, he came here and led a very hard life in the old country and a harder life here. He died very young, and, and I think he had a very tough life, and he had no reason to believe anybody up there was helping him. Mm. Uh, I have found the opposite to be true, that without this upper power, call it God if you, if you want, because that's what I think it is, I wouldn't be sitting here speaking with Raymond Arroyo. I would have gone off the rails a long time ago and never come back. I know mm. that for a fact. So 
Yeah. For me, it's a different story. Michael, in the book, you talk about, um, at one point, going down to the core of your being. You were taken there by a moment in your life. And you said it took you a good number of years to come back. But it was really in that cauldron when you were down and out, you say, um, where you discovered God. Tell me about that mm. period in your life. It's funny you bring it up. And every time I think of it, I get chills through my head, down my spine. I had gone back to university gotten mm -hmm. two master's degrees. I was told, well, in order to be a professor, you better get your PhD from a university because that's your union ticket. Mm. I went to the highest level I could. I got my doctorate from the University of California at Berkeley in a very difficult field of three sciences combined. I earned this PhD in 2.3 years, 2.7 mm. years, 2.6 years. It was a record. I came out thinking I'd finally get this teaching position. 200 universities said white men need not apply. I'm sorry to make it that clear. Affirmative action had started to click in. They were not hiring white men. They were hiring anyone else. It didn't matter. And I was banging my head against a stone wall with two young children. I thought I was failing them. I thought I was failing my ancestors. My, my heart was aching. I didn't know what to do. And so one day in Fairfax, California, I put on my talus and my yarmulke hmm. from the Chabad people. I went out on the deck and I yelled and that valley shook. I know the valley shook. I begged God to save me. And all I said was, just give me a living. I will prove to you I'm worthy. I didn't say, don't make me. I said, I don't need, need to be rich. Just give me a living. I'll prove my value. Mm. It wasn't like, you know, the Red Sea parted and it Cecil right. B. DeMille production. <laughs> years. It took years. But slowly the seas parted. Slowly things came my way as long as I kept working at it. Mm. Because God knows if I get lazy, I'm not a good person. Uh, none of I mean, us are. No, we're not using the why, gifts we're given. That's why I don't retire, even <laughs> at my age. I mean, well, he knows. It, I'll just go bad. Yeah, and, and so we, sh I, we should I also working. say, your family, I mean, through your example, your son is the founder of Rockstar, the, the, the great beverage that everybody, kids are drinking everywhere. Uh, your wife was the head of that company. Is she still president of Rockstar? Well, she's the um, COO. She manages mm -hmm. the books. Wow. Unbelievable. So, I mean, well, he did a great, you know, I don't want to talk about him. I don't like to merge his business with my philosophy. But the fact is, is that he he spent a lot of years with me traveling in the South Pacific. Mm. He he was there with me as a little child. He's mm. seen things that kids would never so lucky to have experienced. Now, whether any of that reflects in his business acumen, I don't know. But all I can mm. say is that we've been very blessed as a family. And mm. I'm trying to say to the world on the on this show that I want to thank God through the show because this is a religious show is it not well we, we cover less? religion sure okay i mean that's what the book god faith and reason is about it was my way of giving back to god my thanks i don't know how else to say it mm. so it's through personal stories through an odyssey i'm not proselytizing i'm not an evangelist mm. i love evangelists they save people but i'm not one i'm not a theologian but I'm it's just your journey. One man. It's your struggle. It's your it's your story. And you find you in the book. You, you meet a a panoply of characters here: a Jewish mobster, <laughs> a Buddhist, an atheist. You're having dinners. Uh, it's about your life as a child. You even have sections. You have a section here that I want to talk about before we run out of time. You say here Halloween is bigger than Christmas. Why do you think that is in America? Well, that's why I had them publish the book this time of year. That's why it's in the bookstores <laughs> right now. Mm -hmm. We've just come through Halloween. Every lawn in the white suburbs, ghosts and goblins and uh, spider webs and this and that. I said, if this isn't the embodiment of paganism, I'd like to know what is. Mm. And so when I grew up in New York City, every other car in Queens, New York, had a little St. Christopher on it. Mm. It gave me faith. I, to know that there were people who had faith. It gave me faith to know that there were faithful people around. It made me feel good. Church on the corner. Mm -hmm. Everything had its place. It was organized, orderly. Now you drive around in New York or Washington, D.C. or San Francisco, there are no St. Christopher statues. Mm -hmm. There are dream catchers. There are voodoo dolls. There are cobwebs hanging off mirrors. I don't know how they can see through the, through the windshield. <laughs> if, if that doesn't symbolize 
the demoralization of America, I'd like to know what does. To me, it's all combined in the fact that Halloween is now bigger than Christmas. Yeah, no, it, it, it's become its own festival. It's much bigger, and they lead up to it like it's a, a holy day. Um, <laughs> t tell me, Michael, um, and you make other observations throughout the book, and I wish I had more time to really delve into it further, but um, it, it's really worthwhile. There is, there is an article I read where you talk about your talent and how you discovered it. And you really attribute mm -hmm. it to your brother, Jerome, and your mother. Mm -hmm. Tell me how you discovered the work of your life, really, one of the great works of your life. Well, it's a sad, tragic story in my family. Every family has one, I suppose. This was, uh, uh, I was the second child. The third child was born. He was a little blonde hair, blue-eyed boy, looked perfectly normal. But after a year or so, they realized there was something off. He couldn't see, couldn't, couldn't hear. Mm. And he was he was crippled, born crippled. Well, it, it destroyed the family, ripped everyone's heart out. And they would put him in the kitchen in a high chair and he would sit there alone all day and they would say, don't go in there and don't bother him. And I thought, what? What do you mm. mean don't bother him? So when no one was looking, I'd sneak into the kitchen. And although he was supposed to be deaf, I would whistle to him. And I would see his eyes light up, and I knew that he wasn't deaf. I knew also mm. there was a soul in there. And in speaking to him in that mysterious way that God gives us, I learned how to communicate with audiences who are silent. I mean, you're sitting in a studio. I'm here alone. We're communicating with a silent audience, but there are millions of people out there. Yeah. That's the same. It's trying to communicate with, with the silent audience. And I, I just learned how to communicate with silent audiences with animals. My little dog, Teddy's always with me. Hmm. I think it's through the gift of my brother, and I would say my silent brother is who I owe it all to. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Tim, uh, before I let you go, the sex abuse and sexual harassment scandal that we've seen engulf not only politics, but now media, entertainment. I mean, it hmm. seems to be spreading. Are you concerned that it's gone too far? And what I mean by that is you have accusers <laughs> Uh, suggesting that, you know, a guy asking somebody out to a drink is harassment. Your thoughts? It's insanity. It's a witch hunt. In the French uh, Revolution, all you had to do was say, j'accuse, and they cut someone's head off. No, mm -hmm. no trial, nothing. We are living through a, a revolution here. God only knows who is behind this, but it's like the French Revolution. The guillotine is falling. Every day, someone else. For whom the bell tolls, the bell tolls for thee. I mean, there's a poem about this. Right. And the accusers don't realize that the guillotine is a very thirsty instrument. There's no amount of blood on earth that the guillotine will be satisfied with. And after the French Revolution got ki through killing all the counter-revolutionaries, what did they do? They started killing each other until the guillotine finally fell silent when there were no, no longer any necks to cut. We see this going on now in the media. Who's next to fall? When is it going to turn on the... When will the women in the media suddenly start being accused of being sexual predators and by whom? When will that start? When will that end? I mean, we have to understand we're a nation of laws. And no matter how many people may line up and say, I accuse you, without a trial, the person is innocent until proven guilty in my book. I don't mm -hmm. care how many people line up, innocent until proven guilty, whether it's Judge Roy Moore in this case, or anyone else, innocent until proven guilty. I want to see a trial. We are a nation of laws, not a nation of, of uh, hanging, public hangings. I want to close with this at the end of the book. Uh, you write, in the end, the search to find God is the mm. finding itself. What does that mean? It's an interesting thing. As I was going to press with the book, it was like my Albert Einstein E equals MC squared mm. relativity moment, which was, where is God? Why is God silent? Well, you see, the idol worshipers, they don't have to worry about where is God. They worship the statue. They worship the tree. They worship the stone. They have something to hold on to. Yeah. But when Judaism came along and we were taught that God is invisible, it, was, it became a paradox for man because it was the first time we didn't have that rock or that tree. So where is this God? Well, we heard about him. We heard he was there. We heard he gave us the Ten Commandments. He did this. He did that. So I realized why God remains invisible to us. Huh. Because if we could see him and we could touch him, we would dismiss him as yesterday's movie. We'd say... Hmm. Oh, I met God yesterday. That was pretty good. But what's what's happening today? What's today's show? So God was so smart by remaining invisible through through, through all the ages. Mankind will always search for him. And in searching for him and looking for him, 
Don't we find them in every leaf, every tree, every dog, every child, every baby, every cloud? Don't we see God's work? Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it reminds me of the line when Jesus uh, meets Thomas after the resurrection, and he wants to touch the wounds, you'll remember, to have confirmation that, you know, this is really the guy he saw crucified. And Jesus tells him, blessed are those who have not seen and still oh. believe. Oh, Which kind of confirms your, your notion there, Michael. Well, I think there's a little of his DNA in me somewhere. Uh, uh, just a little bit, probably more than that. <laughs> Michael Savage, thank you so much for being here. God, Faith, and Reason by Michael Savage is available now in bookstores everywhere and online. What a pleasure.